And I'd like to welcome you to Ska'awe Kuna, Edge of the Knife, directed by Helen Haig Brown and Gwai Edenshaw. Um, to begin with, we'd like to acknowledge that this is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and uh, the Huron-Wendat. Um, we're grateful to work in the community. Um, this film is eligible for the Canada Goose Award for Best Canadian Feature Film, the City of Toronto Award for Best Canadian First Feature Film, and the Grolsch People's Choice Award. And you can vote for your favorite film at tiff.net slash vote. Um, we would also like to thank Isuma um, Distribution International for providing us with the film today. And um, everybody is really in for a very spectacular and unique experience this is an incredible rendering of a classic Haida tale set in the 1800s in Haida Gwaii, and it is a really stunning cinematic achievement, as well as being shot entirely in the Haida language, which is critically endangered, and so this was very much also um, a language revitalization project and really an ambitious undertaking. And I think, you know, it's so rare that we get the chance to see, you know, indigenous stories reimagined in this way for the screen. But I think the depth of these stories um, really also redefines what cinema can be and, you know, really gives us a deeper understanding of the land that we live on. So thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce Gwai Eden Shaw and Helen Hay Brown. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming here tonight uh, or this afternoon. Um, the movie we're going to watch is about Gagi Hit or Gagi, they say in the north. And that is, there's different ways of thinking about it. And, and uh, we've tried to kind of uh, honor all the ways of, of, of thinking about Skagi Hit. I don't know if uh, any of you guys have spent extended periods of time in the woods, but uh, even with, with all the amenities, you know, good fire, you, you start to go a little strange after a while. The, call it getting bushed. Well, what happens when you experience a, a major trauma, like, like uh, you know, falling into the ocean or, or something like that, your body becomes uh, extremely weakened and you go into a state of being where you exist in a, on, a, on a sort of survival level. That's one way of looking at Goggy Hit, you know, this, this, this uh, purely sort of visceral story of survival. But among our people, we also talk about it in a, in a way of, of when you're in that weakened state, there are spirits that can enter you. And, and so uh, they kind of act through you and, and you find yourself uh, lost in that state of being again. And uh, it also exists inside of our Haida secret societies. The Gagi Hit dance is one of the main dances that we use in potlatches and stuff like that. That's the reason why we decided as a, as a first Haida film that we would tell this story because it's something that is... Uh, so familiar to every Haida. There's no Haida that doesn't know who Gagit is. Um, and so, um, but it was used in old times as an initiation. And so we look at this story also as uh, an individual's uh, journey through, uh, you know, what the world might throw at them 
and and also uh, our responsibilities as a, as a community to to hold those people close. Um, I'm just going to be really quick, as quick as possible. Um, uh, one of the things that I just wanted to do a shout out and um, is what was really um, incredible about this film. It was the first sort of co-production between Isuma Productions from Nunavut and the Haida Nation. Um, and part of the things that Asuma brings is just uh, really doing something uh, from the community and so valuing that deeply. And so, um, you know, being a part of this process was super, super inspirational to me. Um, part of the challenge was to uh, do it in the rural community communities of Haida Gwaii and to do it with um, um, first time actors because all local people and to do it in the language which uh, there are um, I think 20 of our cast out of 25 uh, don't speak the language and so I just really want to acknowledge some of the people here today and just what an incredible feat that was. Um, there's three of our uh, leads uh, cast here in the front, if they just want to stand up really <laughs> momentarily. <laughs> Who rocked that? And Jonathan France in the back there, and just give a little wave. Our producer. <laughs> Our producer and cinematographer who, you know, just coming from that, um, coming from that uh, philosophy and way of being and being taught so well up there, uh, came in and was really, really incredible at giving that space and really valuing that community led directed uh, piece. So just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Oh my God, of course, there's, and also we're super, super lucky. We have Alita Kenny Starr in the house, who is the composer for the film. <laughs> is that it? Is that all we have in here? Is that, is that everybody who's here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our delegation has shrunk since the premiere. So yeah, thank you. We'll be back for the Q&A. Thank you. For them, you mean? Do you want to just go straight away? No, I'd like to bring them yeah, up, please. Right. Yeah, yeah. We'd also like to invite up to the stage, please, uh, Willie Russ, who played Kwa, Tyler York, Aditi Gogit, and Adina, Adina Young as Saya. I think it, Alita Kenny Star, if you'd also like to join us up on stage, the composer, the music composer. So thanks everybody. So I was just watching the end credits again and noticing that you had 15 language mentors and three voice coaches. Can you tell me more about the process of working in the language? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, working with uh, our, our first responsibility was to go to the ship, which is our, our immersion program, our Haida immersion program, where all our elders are working. And it was uh, our responsibility to, we got the script, we got some, uh, we, got, we got some script written out and stuff, and we had it audio recorded, but we also had to go and work with all of the elders that were listed on, on, on the credits. And so we, we would go to them and uh, they would crack the whip constantly, making sure we did everything properly. They, they were very, very um, persistent with the way we spoke and the way we pronounced everything. And so um, it was uh, because of what they had done, the elders and, and all of the voice coaches. And uh, we had an acting coach, a, a cowboy. And uh, Trish was our voice coach, teaching us how to project. And so we had to tie all of that into our characters. And it was, uh, it was, it was months, months in the process. And so, because I understand there are quite a few sounds in Haida that don't exist in English. There are four Ks, as I understand it, and clicks and tones as well. Is that right? It's uh, yeah, levels through your throat down to the, your lower oh, Adam's sorry, apple. Just, or, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a process where. Um, the underlying K or, or a regular K, there's a spot in your throat where you have to 
p- push those both out from. And it's not talking from your throat or your larynx or anything like that. You're actually talking from your stomach and all the way up through your body and using your body to speak the language. So it's a... It was very difficult to even say, to figure out how to say tull. And so we had to say all of that and figure it out in a, in a couple of months process. So, yeah. And some pretty tough nannies and nanais, yeah. hey, who just were like, you know, uh, it was pretty amazing. Grandmothers and grandfathers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, well... This one? Yeah, that that wasn't really the worst part because uh, <laughs> Haida language is part of our everyday speaking. Like like uh, none of us here are fluent, but we use Haida every day. Uh, you know, just as part of uh, you know the vernacular of the town. Um, it was important that the actors weren't just learning their lines for rote, that they were learning what they were saying. So, so you know, when they spoke, they could, they could uh, properly deliver what they meant. And Guai had a really amazing idea also of like trying to ensure that things are in an intralineal way. So uh, that uh, working, that they're assuring that they knew each word was connected to what word. Um, and so just lots of those sorts of things that working out how to work within the language and um, how to support and help that process. But just really briefly around language, uh, the step process, there was a translation uh, with the script that worked with uh, elders in the community and translators. And then it went through, um, from there they had audio recordings made of each line from speakers that the actors all got to work with and listen to for months. Then they went through a phase of what we called the boot camp, where they went through an intensive memorization process with uh, uh, elders and speakers who uh, fed them the lines per scene. And I thought that was a really important step because they could be there to help um, to help with um, ensuring like emotive, like um, um, emotion expression, um, you know, just like that there is no up in the tone when you're doing a question, things like that that were really amazing for that sort of one-on-one. Um, and then we also had language people. So during that boot camp, though, we had how many elders from SHIP and everything that came? Like 12? 12 for that two weeks. So a large number of at least half of the speakers that are left. And then through the, through the production as well, there was always a language person on set in the both dialects, the Southern and Northern, who was listening during the delivery and flagging things, uh, whether we had to do other takes and that. So. And has it been screened for everybody there in Haida Gwaii? How did that go? Yeah, well, that was the real test. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, we had uh, two screenings in, in Skidigit and in Mazat. And, um, yeah, I'd say it went all right. They, they uh, didn't chase us out or... <laughs> it went fabulous. <laughs> nobody, yeah, nobody got mad at us yet. <laughs> And everyone seems incredibly happy. Full houses, 600 people in one screening, 520 in the the one before. And uh, yeah. Anybody else have anything to share from the screening? So the screening was amazing on Haida Gwaii. Um, when I was, when we went to Skidigit for the first screening, it was amazing. The, the, the energy in the room was excitement and joy and pride and everything that was good um you know given all the emotions that were put through the film everybody still had all the excitement and when we were up in Masset I felt so many different emotions so the the between the two communities I think they're on different wavelengths of energy so when I was in Masset it was it was a mixture of everything. There were people who could relate to the characters, and but with it all, it was still all the excitement and all the joy. And to have 
520 people and 600 people come and watch a film in their own language was amazing. It was beautiful. It made this trip really easy. <laughs> Questions? Yes, right there. <laughs> What's the next Tida film? We're running down a, a list. We're arguing about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes, right here. I'll repeat. So the question is around protocols. Um, the audience member said that she felt as though what was shared was really private and maybe sacred, and she was wondering if there was um, a process of getting permissions and blessings. Yeah, so uh, as part of the uh, writing team that, that worked on it initially, and we work, in particularly, we work uh, closely with Guagana, Diane Brown. She uh, played Nanai in our in the story but she was there with us kind of every step of the way in the script um we also um spoke to uh chinny claude and chinny steven before they passed so they never got to see this uh movie and <laughs> but but uh, I wouldn't say that it was a formal process of of gathering permissions. It, it was we involved our elders in the process of telling the stories, and and um, I, I suppose received implicit permissions uh, from that. We did receive uh, permission from the people of this Lanlanis clan whose, whose territory were, and their village we were in when we shot. Uh, Yan, where, where we shot, was one of the last places uh, people, as they're moving towards Masset, which is the major northern uh, town, it, it was the the last sort of stopping point and and so during smallpox there there were uh massive deaths in yan and and we kept um out of respect we stayed out of the burial section even even though as high as we're you know we are allowed to go there um we were just so many and, you know, there's still bones that surface in that area and we just didn't want to uh, uh, drag anything up. And then remembering um, so many different, um, el we, you know, also went through the, um, um, uh, the governing structures as well for permission, um, the Council of the Haida Nation, and they, be they were actually... Uh, part they're part of the production company that owns what we were doing um, and then the, all the elders the many many elders hands on the translation so they had lots of you know feedback through that period and then Guaganut who was in the film I remember times when we were shooting we'd go and sit in her tent in the morning and be like we're thinking this for this scene what do you think mm -hmm. you know so there was always that continual and they very much will speak up when <laughs> we're like, oh, are we thinking this? <laughs> no, that's not at all how we do it. <laughs> yeah, so we were always directed really well. <laughs> we had a few rebellions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question at the back. Ways, I guess I'll say, in, in 
So the question is, in Haida Gwaii, are some of the cultural practices still done in the way they were in, like, back in the day or maybe in the way it was depicted in the film? Like, for example, the way they were cutting the fish on the beach and then drying it. Uh, I mean, short answer is yes. Um, w you know, we're still going out and getting halibut. Uh, some of us have dehydrators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I didn't have a dehydrator till about four years ago. Uh, love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we still, uh, every spring is a huge push for seaweed. All, all through the year, uh, you know, we're occupied up that when we're up there with some kind of food happening, you, you know, the, the wind turns and the cockles are going to get thrown up on the beach and you got to go then, or the shots as are going to get it. So it is most definitely done. Um, some other things that happen on Haida Gwaii are programs that bring prevention programs for youth and um, young up and coming leaders or, you know, whichever they choose to be. They have programs where um, they do go out onto the land and they harvest seaweed or they'll go and get razor clams or they go and catch some crabs and they preserve it. They have programs for single moms where they bring in the fish if they can't go out and get their own fish and the moms learn how to dry the fish, jar the fish, anything. If there's berries, they go pick berries. So it most definitely is still there and it's a uh, it's our way of life and we have nothing but gratitude i think for it i think there's time for one more question right at the back there yep so what's the time period noticing that the clothing was a mix of like Oh, there's blouse and then, yeah. So Gwai was the art director, so he's perfect to answer that question. <laughs> uh, we made a conscious decision not to seed it in a specific time. But, you know, we're, we're somewhere uh, post-contact and pre-smallpox. Um, we didn't want to make it in smallpox because that just becomes its own story and, and overwrites everything. Um, so that in a Haida context is f early 1800s to mid 1800s. Yes. Uh, the clothing, like ladies they were uh, cedar strips. Was the clothing cedar strips? Yeah. That was a lot of cedar. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, it's my understanding that there's less than 30 speakers fluent in the Haida language. So what has this meant to the elders that still speak and to the community? Well, uh, our elders used to believe that the language was going to die. And uh, it, was, it was something that they were very, very sad, very sad about and very concerned with but after when we first started this though there wasn't a lot of hope for us to get this project done because we were so brand new and and we were very terrible at pronouncing any of the Haida and getting it into sentences and all this other stuff and getting understanding it but uh, through our hard work uh, the three of us worked very hard together um, we had to be together quite often just to work on the pronunciations and getting the language tight within ourselves and, and as a group and and so as that went along the elders really started to believe that something was going to change or that things were changing and uh, after after this movie was made and after it was screened uh, there's been a huge um, growth spurt in, in people wanting to reconnect with the language and signing up for the language programs and and being a part of that side of the culture our culture is still very strong but the language aspect of it is something that's a little bit weaker 
And so because that this, was, uh, this movie was made, that people are feeling and realizing the importance of our language and, and wanting to take part in it and learn it. And so I feel um, the elders are, are very proud. They feel, they, feel, they feel heard, they feel cared for and loved. Uh, they were the ones who understood and know the language and, and for a long time felt like uh, that their knowledge was going to pass on with them, but I don't feel like they, they feel like that anymore. So. I want to acknowledge the work that you guys did. It is really amazing. And congratulations to you guys, and thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>